Hey everybody, it's Mr. Smeeds. In this video, we'll be going over everything you need to know about the third and final FRQ on the APES 2021 exam, which will involve analyzing an environmental problem and proposing a solution to that problem. If you're ready to think like a mountain and write like a scholar, let's get started. First, make sure to hit the like and subscribe button if you haven't already, turn on notifications. You don't wanna miss the live stream review that I'm doing tonight, Thursday, May 13th, from 8 to 9 p.m. Eastern. I'm gonna be going through the top 10 things I think you should review in the final hours before your exam, Friday, May 14th. So the first thing you need to know about this third FRQ is that you'll be asked to propose a solution to an environmental problem, but you'll also be asked some questions about a data set, a graph, a map, some sort of figure or visual stimulus. So what we're gonna do in this video is break it down into those two parts. We're gonna talk about how you should approach the figure-based questions, but we're also gonna talk about how you should propose the proposed solution question and how you need to be able to justify the solution that you've proposed. So the first tip here is to really focus on all of the labels in the figure or the graph that you're faced with on this FRQ. The number of points that students miss when they don't pay close attention to the axis labels, to the key, legend, is really, really mind-blowing. You have to slow down and you have to be sure that you're earning the easy identify points on these questions. Typically, there will be at least two easy identify points that go with this visual model or this graph. You really want to make sure you earn them. That's my first big piece of advice. Double, triple check these identify prompts because they're just too easy to miss. They're going to be worth one point, just like these harder, more complex explain points. Really want to make sure that you start yourself off on the right foot with a couple of easy identify points. Two common examples of questions you may be asked about this data set or this figure is to look at a graph and describe a change or a trend in data over time. Now, what's really important here to do is frame that time period correctly. If you're taking this on paper, I would actually mark off the time period on the graph. If you're taking this digitally, you can still use your finger to kind of trace the outline of this graph and look exactly at the period of time that you need to. The other thing to do is try to be precise and use some actual data. So saying that a value increase from X to Y over Z period of time is a great way to do that. The other thing is to be careful and watch for little more minute trends that are going on here. So are the data, is this value increasing over the entire time or does it increase for a period, decrease and then increase again? Does it increase substantially more than just a little bit? Does it decrease dramatically more than just a little bit? So try to give a little bit of a modifier. If you say that it only increased or only decreased, you run the risk of being a little bit too brief in your answer. Really try to describe your trend with a bit more detail. The second piece of advice I have for you is to be careful if you're looking at a map and identifying a region that you're using two directional terms. So students may be tempted to say the south part of America or the southern part of America is a part where X, Y, or Z environmental problem exists. But if you can be a little bit more precise and say the Southwest, or even use another area as a location, like the area south of Michigan, where I'm from, that would be a great way to go about describing a location on a map. Now that we've talked about some of the basic tips and tricks, pieces of advice here, we'll take a look at two specific examples of graphs and figures that you might see on this FRQ. So first off here, we have a graph, which is showing us the change in temperature in both the Arctic and globally from the period 1900 to 2016. Now, the first thing I wanna call your attention to in this graph is the y-axis. So you might be tempted to look at this and just see temperature in degrees Celsius, but we have to really read this label and notice that this is actually the temperature difference from average. So we're not talking about negative one or negative two degrees here. We're talking about one degree below the 1981 to 2010 average. So that's a really important distinction. The next thing I wanna call your attention to here is the key. So in the key, we have to notice that if we're asked about the Arctic, we need to be really careful that we're looking at the dotted line. And if we're asked about temperatures globally, we should be looking at the bold line. So now that we've taken a look at our y-axis, we've made sense of it. We know that we're comparing here the 1981 to 2010 average, and we're seeing how does the Arctic and how does the global average differ from that background 1981 to 2010 average. We know what our key says. Now we're ready to actually tackle the first question. So if we look at this first question here, we can see it's asking, based on the data in the graph, identify the change in difference 
from average temperature in the Arctic between 1980 and 2016. So the first thing I would do if I were marking this up, uh, whether it's actually on paper or whether this is just in my head, is I'm going to look at this and go, okay, we're looking at the Arctic, we're looking at the Arctic here. So I need to make sure that I'm looking at the correct line. You wouldn't believe the number of students who make the simple mistake of just not orienting themselves with the key. So now that we know which line we're looking at, we need to look at the time period. I would also physically mark this up if I'm taking the paper administration. If you're doing it digitally, you may even wanna kind of trace on the screen with your finger, but we're looking at 1980. So I'm gonna draw a line here. Uh, and then we're looking to 2016. So I'm gonna draw a line here. So now I know I've really framed um, the time period that we're looking at, and that's really helpful. So I'm gonna mark this right here because this is where both the dotted and bold lines seem to intersect. Um, so we're you know, right about a negative 0.5, it looks like. Now a pro tip here is if you're taking the paper exam, use a straight edge like your paper to actually line up and figure out what is this value. But I would say this is about negative 0.5. And so then we know if we go up here, we're gonna look at the dotted line and we're just above one. So if we're just above one and we were just below negative 0.5 here, we know our answer is gonna be something like a 1.5 degree change. So we'd wanna make sure that we give you know, the correct units there or that we write this out as a sentence. But that would be how I would break down this graph, how I would approach it if I'm writing it on paper. And again, you can't do the same thing digitally, but what you can still do is use your finger on the screen to actually kind of trace out where it is you're looking at and really make sure you have these values aligned. Now we'll take a look at a diagram or what we might call a visual model. So in this case, we're looking at the carbon cycle and it's really helpful if we look at this first question here, identify a process shown in the diagram that removes carbon from the atmosphere. So I would underline here removes carbon because we wanna know that it's leaving the atmosphere. So what we need to do now is look for an arrow that's leaving the atmosphere. Right off the bat, we see two. We see photosynthesis and we see an arrow that's going to something that says CO2 in water. Now, if I were an ape student on this, I'm going to approach photosynthesis because it's easier to identify. You may need some extra details in there with CO2 in water. CO2 in water isn't exactly the full answer. You may need to pad it with some details like carbon dioxide can dissolve into the water. But if you look at photosynthesis, hopefully you're familiar with photosynthesis and that's a straightforward process where you can use this as an answer for this identify prompt. Now what I wanna do here is take a look at C because C is a great example where we, even though it's identify, we need to pad our answer with some additional detail here. A key point I wanna make sure students understand is that identify means identify a complete thought. So a lot of times students see identify and think, oh great, I can just write one word or a really simple idea. Yes, it can be a simple idea, but it should be a complete idea. This is a great example of why you need a little bit more than one or two words. If you look at this question in letter C, identify a process shown in the diagram that sequesters, so removes or stores carbon from the atmosphere. And this is the key word for a geological period of time. Geological period of time is going to refer to a very long time period. So we're not talking about photosynthesis now. We're not talking about dissolving of carbon dioxide into the water. Those are pretty short processes. They're not geological processes or geological periods of time. So if we look here, you may be tempted to say, well, limestone. But notice this is asking us for a process. Identify a process. Limestone is not a process. So we're going to say the formation of limestone but we're leaving something out if all we say is the formation of limestone. The diagram, the visual, which we wanna lean on heavily since it's been given to us, is very clear that that limestone is formed from calcium carbonate sediments. So you are going to wanna say in your answer, the formation of limestone from calcium carbonate sediments. Another big uh, adage I like to tell Abe students on these diagrams, is if they give it to you in the diagram, they expect you to use it. So they do expect you to say the formation of limestone from calcium carbonate sediments. If we were to look at oil and gas, a good example here would be the formation of oil and gas from organic sediments. And so again, if the diagram is specifying that there is something leading to that formation of limestone, you should use that in your answer. The next tip I have for you on this FRQ refers to the proposing a solution portion of the FRQ. 
the number one mistake that students make here is they're too vague or they're too brief. You need to try to give a who or a what or a how to your solution. So a great example is this idea of a city wanting to reduce its tropospheric ozone or its photochemical smog levels. Students may be tempted to say people should drive their cars less because that would lead to less NOx emissions and less NOx emissions leads to lower tropospheric ozone. So they're on the right track here with the basic idea. But how are people going to drive their cars less? Are they going to wake up one morning and just decide they shouldn't drive their car to work? That's not very likely, right? So try to give a who or a what or a how. Great example of this is a government in the city that's investing in public infrastructure for public transportation. Another great example is a government that's running a public education campaign, encouraging people to bike to work, maybe even installing more bike lanes or putting signage that encourages more biking. Those are great solutions that are the same basic idea of getting people to drive less, but we've given a how for driving less and a who. The government will run a public education campaign or invest in public infrastructure. Now people are less willing or likely to drive because there are easier options. You really want to try to give this extra layer of detail to your solution. The other thing that you need to watch out for on this proposed solution FRQ is that your solution is actually possible or feasible. The number one mistake I see here is students write that the government should either ban something or it should raise the prices. So it's not very likely that the government's going to come out and ban the use of oil. It's also not very likely and not really possible in the United States that the government can simply raise the prices. They just don't have that power. Uh, we live in a capitalist country and there are you know, international markets that set these prices. And so the government can't just call up you know, the oil manufacturers one day and say the price has gone up. So we need to be mindful of that. And what we should use instead is the idea of a tax credit or a tax incentive. So while the government is not very uh, ready to ban things or just raise prices, they will offer tax incentives. So if a government wants to discourage the use of oil, they could offer a tax incentive for renewable energy sources. They could do this to homeowners in the form of a tax credit. If they put solar panels on the roof, they could do it for geothermal power plants by giving them a huge tax credit to make it cheaper relative to other forms of energy for them to build this geothermal plant. So keep that in mind. Tax incentives, tax credits are a go-to proposal solution answer, especially if you're looking at an energy-related problem. The third tip I have for you on this FRQ is to be ready to justify your solution. What that means is you have to use a little bit of APES content knowledge to actually connect your solution to the problem. You don't just have to describe what the solution is, but you have to say, why does this solve the problem? A good way to know if you're going to earn this point is whether or not you've actually put in some APES content knowledge here. This is a great example of a point that's going to require you to recall something from the course, something about environmental science, and use it to connect the solution to the problem. The one thing I do want to say about this propose a solution, justify solution portion of this FRQ is that those two portions are linked. So what do I mean by that? If the solution that you propose is not on the scoring rubric, you're not going to be able to earn the justify point that goes with it. So it's kind of like that extra free throw on an and one in basketball. You have to get the first proposed solution point to then get the justify. So if you're running low on time and you don't think you have a solid solution to this problem, I would skip those last two questions, the proposed solution and justify the solution. They're typically going to be some of the more challenging points and they're linked together. That being said, if you know this is a weak portion of your FRQ writing already, go down in the video description below and I made a playlist with all of the videos that are linked to topics that have environmental solutions directly in the CED. And so that's a great playlist that could hopefully help you come up with more environmental solutions that you could go to on this FRQ. If you want to take a look at a great example of a practice FRQ that involves describing the environmental problem, proposing a solution to that problem, and justifying that problem, take a look in the video description below. There's a Google Doc down there that has a practice FRQ involving all three of those skills, and there's also a linked video walkthrough with Amy Fassler. She's a veteran APES teacher. She really knows her stuff. She contracts for the college board, and so you know that her video walkthrough of this is going to be awesome. Go check that out. And I encourage you to use that as practice for this proposal solution FRQ. So now that we've gone through the types of questions you can expect to see on this proposal solution FRQ, I hope you're feeling a little more comfortable about the FRQ writing process. 
I hope you're feeling a little less stressed and a little less anxious about your APES exam, especially if you're taking it tomorrow, Friday, May 14th. If you're taking it June 11th or the May 27th, you've got a couple weeks yet, but you still really wanna practice these FRQ writing skills so that you're ready to go when your exam date comes. Finally, make sure to leave a comment below in the comment section. That's my favorite part of APES exam prep season, seeing the positivity, seeing the support that you guys have, seeing how excited all of you are for this APES exam. It's a really special class, it's a special community, and it's so fun to be a part of it. I want you guys to remember going to the exam that your score does not define you. You can still be the next Jane Goodall, you can still be the next Rachel Carson if you don't get a five on the APES exam. Take a deep breath, stay calm going to the exam, and as always, think like a mountain, write like a scholar.